turns to shit, okay? It's true. And here we go. Welcome to the Elders Council, guys. Nice to see everybody in. And Lauren just joined. The, he just joined the Dragon Ship crew here on uh, the Elders Council. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, nice to have you guys here today. How are you guys all doing? First of all, beautiful Sunday. I hope the weather's great where you're at. You know, Mark, you got any announcements or anything going on? Can you hear me? Okay, Mark. I guess Mark can't hear us. How about uh, Laurent? Can you hear us? I love your shirt. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> and you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Excellent, excellent, excellent. For some reason, I think Mark is muted. Let me ask him. Uh, he's good. Uh, and the Texas Chad. All yes, sir. Deep in the heart of come and take it country. That's right. Come and take it. How are you doing, man? What do you got going on? Man, it was such a beautiful weekend here, you know, good to be back on the show, uh, all kinds of stuff rolling around in my head. Hey, that's fantastic, man. Hopefully it's all good stuff. We're going to talk today a little bit. I'm going to bring somebody else on here. Uh, give me just a second here. I'm going to bring one of our younger guys up. He He's going to give us a perspective. When I say young, I just mean millennial. Give us uh, some perspective on our topic today. I think you guys will appreciate him. We're going to send him, and that's Huds. Huds is going to come on, and he'll give us a perspective on why. I mean, today, the title of the show, I mean, we're going to talk about emotionalism and uh, why it's impo important to regulate your emotions in this uh, age of emotionalism. And is empiricism important? How about rationalism? We'll get into that conversation, hopefully tell you some stories, and you guys will learn from it. It'll be fantastic. I think that Mark might be able to hear us right now. I can hear you now. I was I couldn't hear you before. So, uh, so there in, in uh, uh, you're in Louisiana, aren't you, Mark? Uh, Missouri in St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri. Yeah, I was Saint working Louis, in a Missouri. town called Louisiana. Oh, okay, yeah. right on, right on. So, uh, show me state, right? Yeah, that's the place. Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> show me, show me the money, Mark. You got anything going on? How was your show yesterday? I was pretty good. Yeah, we talked about passing to Kevin Samuels. I didn't know him personally, of course. I just, uh, you know, watched his videos. But I liked him because he was direct and straightforward, which, as you know, offends a lot of people nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, huh? Isn't that something else? Uh, yeah. That's what a shame. I mean, it makes. It was a surprise. I was surprised yeah. and saddened about it. I just, yeah, you never know. And, and the one thing is, he did not die alone. So, nope. I think maybe he, you know, he's doing what he loves. So that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. God bless you for that, man. He, uh, he did it his own way and uh, was quite red pilled and said things that needed to be heard that was somewhat unflattering. Yeah. Uh, to many in, uh, in, in society, but it needed to be said because it, it was overlooked and discounted for so long, right. especially in his community, you know, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> it, it, to, to the detriment of all of us, actually. So, so yeah, definitely. And shoot, man, made me feel old. He's definitely younger than I am. So, well, I tell you what, it's like he told people what they needed to hear. And anytime you do that, you don't, people want to be flattered. They want to be coddled. And when you tell people what they need to hear, it takes a man to accept that. I mean, I have people to tell me what I need to hear. It doesn't feel good. Sometimes it hurts, but I got to take a look at myself. If it hurts me, it's probably a truth within me that I need to look at and think about, maybe fix something. Most people don't want to do that, as you guys know. Yeah, and look who joined us, another legend right there. <laughs> Much like Kevin Samuels, uh, Mr. Phil Foster. Talk, we're talking about emotionalism today. <laughs> What's uh, up, how man? You regulate your emotions. Good, good. How are you, man? What's happening in, in Phil Foster's world, man? Man, I just... Uh been busy uh today sunday's the first sunday of the month i do a bunch of different zoom calls with uh, different groups of men on fitness and hormones and things like that and i'm getting ready to do the the stream here at 6 30 or 6 40 my time and I told you i'd hop in here i want to definitely check this out i haven't had an opportunity to do that yeah just no managing worries. my time no worries thanks for thanks for jumping in yeah i'd like to uh 
let's give everybody a basis. We've been doing the elders council for just about a month now. We're doing it on Sundays and we're taking a positive slant on red pill knowledge, experience, and stories. Uh, we're kind of taking the guys that are survivors in life and have been around for a little while uh, and have dodged all the bullets for at least a little while. And uh, we're going to try to pass on that knowledge in a very positive manner uh, for everybody out there. And I think it's sorely needed, uh, just like Kevin Samuel's message. You know, in his community, it was so sorely needed, yet it was so unflattering to many, many, many. And um, that was uh, sad to see him go that quickly before he got to deliver it to even more. Laurent. Good. The German poet used to say there are two types of immortality. There's a little immortality when people who know you remember you after you passed on. And then there's a great immortality, the people who didn't know you who remember after you passed on. So as Mark said, he didn't know him personally, but he knew of him. And the body of work of Kevin Samuels will be is tremendous and it will impact. And the ideas that we resist in the first place are the ideas that we make us grow. Because if we immediately adhere to the idea, well, it's within our comfort zone. There's no growth there. So mm -hmm. the, the uncomfortable truths are the ones that make us grow, like make yeah. us think, like, uh, maybe, I, maybe I missed this one. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, the thing that amazed me is, you know, I, when I first started watching, it was after he'd already sent this message. He was very focused on, you know, black men and women together and, and recovering. I didn't realize, you know, many of the things he was saying in uh, – you know, just because, you know, I'm I'm not associated with it much. You know, I have some friends, but I you wouldn't even think. But then I listened and I realized it was a much bigger message. It wasn't just isolated to his community. This has actually penetrated well beyond that. I think they might be ahead of us by a decade or so coming out of the 60s early and the civil rights movement and all of that. I tried to get Offie Kingdom on here. He's got an excellent perspective on this. And, yeah, that message can can really sink in and one of the things i noticed with kevin is when he would talk to these guys he was always very cool very calm i don't think i've ever seen him lose his cool he had emotional regulation mm. and yet all his guests and many of the people that were critics were wildly emotional yeah right mark yeah <laughs> yeah he yeah. had to shut them down once in a while and actually put them off because they wouldn't shut up so he would just kick them off the show kick them off the one the phone call yeah, yeah, exactly. He didn't put up with any BS. That was yeah. uh, quite unusual because most uh, most people in the media certainly don't do that. They play to that. I mean, that's what some of the Purple Pill guys do, right? They sell the story that somebody wants to hear. It's quite lucrative, actually. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, I was just going to uh, get this started. And, I, you know, I'm not going to do the promotions. I mean, you can see down at the bottom, I'm trying to help Aaron out. Aaron was here uh, last week or the week before. He's got a new course coming out and it's the minimalism course. I mean, take control of your life and become minimalist because minimalism as a philosophy, it can be quite, quite fulfilling actually. I mean, we are marketed to endlessly today and part of, part of marketing if you've ever read propaganda by Edward Bernays is to strike a chord with you emotionally. And when they do that, you will you will purchase things and buy things to satisfy that emotional need. And that's one of the reasons why women spend 60 to 70 percent of all of the money out there as far as consumers are concerned, because they're a little bit more sensitive to emotional types of advertising, but not by much. Um, yeah, so that, that reminds me of you. Remember when nine one one after that during that next year, I stayed away from the newspapers and the media. But I don't. They out, army surplus goods just sold out. Generators, all yeah. that. They made millions of dollars on it because everybody, a yeah. lot of people were so afraid. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know what, Aaron uh, really goes into detail on is how to live a minimal life and have be it quite fulfilled because. I know you guys know this. All of you have been around long enough. I mean, we, we end up owning a lot of stuff, right? But when we own a lot of stuff, that stuff starts to own you. <laughs> and this is what this minimalism philosophy is all about. And I just want to look at the link on the bottom, guys. Check it out. Uh, go over there and check out Asshole Consulting uh, with Aaron Clary and, and give him a look. I, the link will be in the, uh, in the descriptor, too. So I just want to do a shout-out for Aaron, Aaron Clary. 
on minimalism. I think all of us can certainly appreciate uh, that philosophy. And that is quite fulfilling for many. I, I could tell you a story about me. I mean, I got caught up just not too long ago and I saw this knife and it was an assisted opening thing. And I saw it on Amazon and it just struck that emotional chord with me. And I practice mindfulness, but it struck something with me from my childhood and I had to have the damn thing. And I just dropped, you know, 150 bucks on that thing. Just, ah, oh, it's nothing. I convinced myself emotionally that it would be nothing. And then I got it and opened it and I looked at the damn thing and I went, what the hell was I thinking? I have 50 knives in the drawer. This is stupid. <laughs> Thank God it was one of those uh, free returns. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it creeps up on you for sure, you know? Yeah. Definitely. So let me see if I can open this here. I have a share, and we'll just take a look at it and start chopping it up. Tell me what you think about this video and the symptoms that you guys see in your life about this Insane amount of emotionalism going on. Okay. And there we go. Now, there might be a Karen or two in here, so. I'm right here. Are you going to get off the aircraft or are you going to sit there and scream? I'm just asking. Because it's, it's going to be your I aircraft. got some so keys. I got some keys. Both of you. I don't know if you guys noticed, I sped it up just a little bit, but these two gals are mad at each other and they're both holding pepper spray in and outside of a car over a parking lot. <laughs> Shoot. Anyway, we'll keep going. It's just a high level of emotionalism. I just want to cry. That's all I want to do right now. My phone! No! Why do you even take orders? You can't make them in Finkel's food! Are you f***ed? I don't care anymore! I gotta go feed my two-year-old! You! You can't take orders! Tell people you can't! It's just a now these are neighbors <laughs> and the guy that was crying that just wanted to cry he was crying over a video game oh, i found all of this in like less than five minutes now th these are neighbors look at look at the interaction between neighbors can you imagine thank god i haven't had bad neighbors but i could only imagine it's there it's this family right beyond a reasonable doubt how how do you know that yeah exactly walk the fuck away because you don't know shit you don't know shit Shit. Yeah, exactly. You know shit. I know shit. You know shit. You own this house? Do you own this house? Get the fuck off my Do property. Get the fuck off my property. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Do you own this house? This is not my house. It is not. So you shut the fuck up, you little motherfucker. Do you own this Do house? Job. I have a Do fucking job. job. I'm babysitting for my fucking you? mom, you dumb bitch. You know I've got my own apartment. I've got my own fucking house. I've got my own really? car. Yes, you're fucking stupid. You no, don't know shit. You're stupid. And this shit is all. They don't even have a fucking You're full of shit. It's not even funny. Jeez. Okay, okay, okay. We'll get rid of that. So I just wanted to set the mood, guys. There yeah, that's is. It. <laughs> there is. Welcome, Huds. Appreciate I you coming. I want your perspective. Yeah, I, I appreciate a young man's perspective here. But uh, and then post it all on the internet. It took me less than five minutes to put that together. I tried to condense it, and make it fast. But the illustration 
is, and I've actually seen this too. You can just go to the mall and people watch a little bit. The level of, listen to them speak with each other. I mean, notice that we're quite civil. We can have disagreements, but our communication is not really that debate argument style. And it's just invaded the entire Western culture, in my opinion, right here, at least in California. Maybe it's not so bad where you're at HUDs or in Texas, they all respect each other because they're packing heat. I'd like to think that, uh, Jimmy. And you you know, just live in that delusion, right? Huh? <laughs> so you live in that delusion. <laughs> oh, that you're all packing heat and so you're all polite? Well, no, nah, that everybody's polite and they got their shit together. Okay. <laughs> all right. But I'm uh, say that's location like that. independent. It is, huh? It, it is. Okay. Great. Uh, so definitely seeing a lot of emotionalism out here in California. And I think, you know, looking at social media, it's amplified. Am I wrong on that? 100%. 100%. And actually, Thor, I got a funny story for you on this. So um, I just got back from a vacation I took with my girl this weekend. And um, in the parking lot, there's no way that it was sideswiped because there was no other markings. Somebody didn't like how we had parked because it was too close to them. And I mean, I, I can't prove for certain, but I'm pretty sure somebody got frustrated by that because they couldn't open their door. So they punched out the window or kicked out the window, either or. And it's just the the reactiveness that I'm seeing today is is unbelievable. And I really don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I I, I, th I definitely think the pandemic plays a role. You know, I was just going to go there. Yeah. Did we we amped up a tremendous amount of fear and uncertainty? And I think one way of dealing with it is to lash out. You know, trying to take actions, and we end up taking actions. You know, these frustrations out. You know, when I'm tired, and when I'm a little bit uh, on edge, I'll lash out. Definitely, I'll, I'll catch myself, you know, goddamn this or son of a bitch, you know, and even on dumb little shit that I do. I mean, <laughs> did I just do that? You guys find that too sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. It's other, it's, it's, it's other words. You motherfucker. <laughs> no, 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 no. My apologies. Yeah, that too. That too. I mean, I used to, I used to kick the dog. No, I know. <laughs> No, the shit, the dog, the dog, the dog's the best because the dog actually teaches me a lot of good shit, you know, it really does, you know, dog's a good thing. Well, let me make a point about this. Yeah. Okay. Let's say there's more of this now than let's say 50 years ago. I mean, I think we'd all agree with that or maybe it's amplified because of social media. Mm -hmm. But do you think if the people worked as hard now as they did 40 or 50 years ago or 60, that they would have that much energy be throwing these fits? They're just... It's almost like when I used to fight, when I was in the gym working out, you you could come up and call me pretty well whatever you wanted to, and I wouldn't fight you. When I'm not fighting, I'm more easily triggered. But when mm. I, because I was working hard, I was working out, I didn't have the energy that I just didn't give a shit about whether the neighbors threw trash out in the yard and it blew over in mine or some crazy crap. But these people are like, they need something to go off about because their life is so comfortable and easy here in the U.S., you don't have this stuff in third world countries because those people are just trying to survive during the day. We, we've made, it's, we're just killing ourselves with comfort and ease, I believe. Oh, absolutely. Lauren, please. So I live in Japan, right? And uh, in Japan, like, you would never see people behaving like that. Never. Like, those emotionality and all this, you'd be laughed at. People would look at you. You'd be so out of context, out of character. Mm. I mean, here in Japan, there's a very simple thing. He who loses his cool loses the, the argument. It doesn't matter what the argument, doesn't matter what mm. it is. But as the, the second you lose your cool, that's it. You lost, you lost the debate. Go recompose yourself. Come back. Eat some chocolate. Buy some shoes. And then come back. <laughs> now, in Japan, do they practice shunning as well? Public shunning when somebody you know, crosses that social line? What, what does it mean, shunning? Uh, like where a, they reject you from yeah. society for that behavior? Yeah, to ignore you. Oh, to ignore you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that you make yourself a fool, so there's a lot of shame that is attached to it. Like, yeah. Japan is a society that functions on shame instead of guilt. Like, okay. the, the Christian guilt doesn't exist here. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The dishonor is so heavy mm. a burden, mm. yeah. and that's that's taught from from birth, right? That's conditioned. Uh, yeah, very, very, very early on. It doesn't mean that people are not emotional. People are emotional just like everybody everywhere else. Right. They're just better at bottling up. For instance, there was a, there was they took um, it, there was a very interesting study where they showed like Japanese people and like an embarrassing situation, and, t- and they took screenshots and and videos, and you see that the nervous laugh, the nervous giggle. Showing up all the time, so they, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> all the time. Whereas the same thing in the U.S., like would trigger people, and but it's very different. Country by country is very different. So the Brits and the the Japanese are the ones who bottle it up better. Yeah, is it a bottling up, or do they just have a filter on their emotion? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of filtering. Like the micro oh. emotions still show up, but there's a lot of filtering, and in the end, it becomes second nature. Yeah. When you've lived there for long enough, you know that you don't do it. But it, it, no, the, there's a, it doesn't mean that those emotions don't exist. It means that they're repressed, and it means that they're channeled elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I've done a lot of work with uh, some folks on their emotional um, regulation. I called it emotional durability when I did some of my work with it. But some of the stuff that I'd found out is really, really interesting in that <clears throat> when you are regulating emotion, you acknowledge that it's there because they're very powerful. You know, Emotional thinking comes from feelings in the body and circumstances and sensory inputs. Those become emotions and they're not really thoughts with words, but they're coupled with the feelings. They're very low level in, in, in the animal kingdom. These emotions drive rapid, rapid reactionary decisions. And in a survival situation, those are very useful. Boy, if the tiger jumps out, the emotions go high. Now, boom, go, right? And then yeah, above can. that, we have the, the rational my, a rational thought uh, process, uh, which males have used because we have to figure out, we have to problem solve all the time in order to survive and take care of our mates. We end up um, using that part of our brain that says, hey, look, those woolly mammoths are big. They're big. They stink. We get close to them. They kill us. They throw us. They stomp us. Maybe we should corner them and throw giant boulders on them. That requires a different type of communication and thought as a community then the emotional thinking oh scary big that won't get it done but you know also the, the the emotion of man my mates will starve if i don't figure out this problem so there's that there's that future thought of fear like wow what if they starve i don't want to see the ones that i love and care about starve i need to solve a problem so i set that emotion aside i acknowledge it that's a horrible future thought i've seen people starve before now how do i work to solve this problem to kill these giant beasts and harvest all this meat and be set for the next six months right that's kind of long-winded but rational thought is a little bit slower not much but it doesn't discount the emotions per se you know uh in fact there's in between emotionality or emotionalism and rationalism is something called empiricism you guys familiar with empiricism So that has to do with the senses. All truth is from your sensory input versus the the rational thinking, which is there's truth beyond it, right? Um, Anyway, I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but I think it's important that we understand those as part of our education coming up because it gives us a tremendous amount of controls over our minds and our bodies to not be reactionary to these emotions and have so many reactionary inputs. I mean, we've all been in that... uh, (laughs) that crazy relationship, right? Where we have that button on our chest. You guys know it's like the easy button for staples, right? It says easy. Yeah. Push it, it goes easy. That's so easy. But what it really is, is it's that button that your girlfriend can push that go. And then you do what Phil said, motherfucker. <laughs> and you go off, man. It's the steam button, right? And guess what? Her finger, she just brushes that dust off. She knows right where to go to hit the center. And it's easy for her. Boom. It's the emotional reaction button. Not very useful for us men to behave like that. And you add alcohol and that button gets about this big. <laughs> right? So, uh, so yeah, I think that uh, a huge component of educating young boys today is not only rites of passage, because rites of passage do deal with your emotion and they do it through physicality, which, Phil, you really know something about, and so does uh, Jimmy. Um when you are pushed to the absolute limits, 
you really don't have the energy left to deal with those emotions, but they're still there. And you have to re you have to learn to regulate them if you are to accomplish the task at hand. And that becomes greater than the emotions that are flooding through your body. I know I'm kind of monologuing here, but Phil, you want to add your, your points on emotionalism versus empiricism? Yeah, I would just uh, say, you know, I just wanted to circle back on what Laurent was saying, you know, how in, in where he's at in that culture over there, they behave in that fashion. And, and over here in the West, obviously, I'm going to say that most dudes or men these days, they aren't even dudes or men. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of that emotionalism is coming from, too, as well. Wouldn't you agree with that, Thor? Would yeah. you not agree that most men are actually feminized? Yes. To the point to where they don't know how to act like men anymore. You know, Mark Daniels was saying, hey, well, back in the day, 60 years ago, these, these everybody was working hard. You know, they didn't have the energy to act like girls. Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're mired in comfort, right? Yeah. And it's time and again with these men that I deal with all the time, you know, in, in different men's communities, these guys, they, you know, it's like, okay, dude, get, put the TV remote down, put the pint of Ben and Jerry's down. You can get out there and do something different with yourself. You know, I don't understand why my life is like this. I don't understand why, you know, all these problems are, are, are occurring in my life. You know, why do I react to every little thing my wife says to me? You know, you know, you know, obviously a lot of red pill theory and things like that. They're saying, OK, well, you got to be the oak, the stoic, you know, don't say anything. You know, S was it STFU or whatever, you know, shut, you know, shut it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that wisdom right there for a lot of these men, I think, is, is, a, is a lost deal because they're feminized. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, and so, uh, you know, the emotionalism and kind of like that reel that you showed me, you saw on the private chat, I put bro. I mean, you know, that's like those are like grade 10 Karens. That's insane. You know, <laughs> you know, basically when you can own someone's emotions like that, you completely own them all the way. Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and you can pick them apart, you know, but just by not even re responding or replying. I think that men inherently want to be the stoic, but I think they become feminized. They're low T, you know, and, and society has comforted them and lulled them into a sense of I don't have to do anything anymore. Kind of like you were saying about the woolly mammoths. Let's corner them and throw boulders on them. <laughs> yeah. Dude, if you put half of these dudes in this world, in America, out there and said, okay, go survive for a weekend. Hmm. Here's a loincloth and a stick. They'd be dead. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, no, there's nothing there at all. So, no, you're right. I agree. I uh, agree 100%. Um, and uh, Huds, what's your experience coming up as a young man? In America, you're probably seeing more emotional displays on the male side that we did when I was coming up. Even though the emotions existed, we did have things in place that taught men how to regulate them through sports, teams. Uh, academia was much different. There was a higher level of competition designed to get you to problem solve versus the communitarian way of educating people today, which you know Phil kind of mentioned it and. And so did Jimmy about feminizing of men, which would definitely include, you know, a heightened level of emotions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And even though, um, and I'll be completely frank and honest here, like even though I was a part of teams doing sports, lots of things, very competitive growing up, um, I did get into a situation where, um, where a, a woman I was dating and living with knew how to push my buttons and I ended up getting arrested over it. And so I just think that um, at least what I see with those around me, um, it, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just the, the coddling that everybody seems to get uh, growing up, mm -hmm. what it is, but it's, it's not, it's not good. It's not healthy. Yeah. And then when you go to challenge somebody, especially if, if somebody um, I, I noticed this all the way through college when, a guy would complain about not getting women and not being respected. And then you tell them, okay, these are some things you can do. They get reactive as if you're telling them they're wrong. And it's yeah. like, but you're asking me for help. So yeah. I'm trying to understand what the issue is here. So I just think for whatever reason, society has just kind of pushed itself that way and people don't know how to deal with it. And people can't suck up their egos and just listen when they're trying to solve a problem. Yeah, I agree with that. So, so what is our solution guys? I mean, I know when I, you know, when I, when I consult with some young men, you know, getting them to be physical really, really quickly gives them something to, 
take their emotional focus and put it on. So that's where I always start. But it has to be more than that because, you know, there's such a thing as called overthinking. And if you look, if you look up Google, you look up overthinking, it is, uh, it is really interesting if you look into it because it talks about borderline personality disorder overthinking, something called rumination which having consulted some young men happens a tremendous amount. And this is where you think of something that occurred, an incident that may have occurred just in the past week or so, or even before. And you think about the issue over and over again, much like crazy. But this time you try to say, what's different? Why did I do this? How come I didn't anticipate it? Now, there are some useful lessons to be learned in the past, but that is not what I'm talking about. This is just, it's, 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 a, it's thinking about it to the point of it detriment that you're almost trying to change history so that your ego is protected moving into the future versus accepting what is and moving forward and sometimes you just don't you know you don't know why things are the way they are and you just got to move forward from it and and go it's go time you can't sit there and your thoughts and ruminate now i'm going to give you guys out there in the audience and every you guys here would already have done this though but I will challenge you because as I was reading about overthinking, I looked at some numbers. I'm not going to put them up here. But this is a male-female thing, and I think this has a lot to do with how men are feminized right now. I challenge you to go out there in a friendly conversation with women today. And then I want you to look rather stoic, kind of mastery, and then say, oh, I bet you're somewhat of an overthinker, aren't you? 99% of the women will come back and say, how did you know I was an overthinker? <laughs> this is a common trait where they ruminate, ruminate, ruminate. And it's something fun that you guys can do in the audience to prove what I just said. And then you can kind of understand yourself and where, you know, when we're overthinking something, try to learn how to recognize it, take action. And when I say take action, it's either mental or physical. I like mindfulness because mindfulness consists of breathing techniques. I think we've all done Wim Hof or box breathing or, you know, uh, dragon's breath, things like that. That's very good because it puts you in the now. I like motorcycle riding that does that too, but so does exercise. There are many things that put you in the now. It could be so simple as a five minute, you know, the breathing. I feel my lungs. I feel my belly. I feel my toes. All that stuff slows that inner dialogue down so we're not ruminating. It's a very basic thing that I just said called mindfulness. You have to get the habit or you're always spinning that wheel. That rumination, I think, might be the hamster wheel. Mm. What do you guys think about this? That's what I offer <clears throat> when I talk about that. And then I try to get further into it with rational rationalism. I, I mean, with the definition of rational. I think a good mix of rationalism and empiricism goes a long way with young men because you know one involves a scientific method the others involves your senses and what's apparent and in front of you then you can get into occam's razor and all those sort of philosophies Lauren, you had something dad um three things uh three persons i'd like to go to to quote on this i mean i do it i did a lot of rumination uh and then i'd like to talk about wendy wood peter goldwitzer and uh what's her name uh mel collins so wendy wood wendy wood is a uh, is an uh, american psychologist who studied automacity she basically concluded that we spend 65 percent of our day in complete automation she did a study like we just repeat what what's going on the chatter in our head now she did this study on first year graduate on first year student and you know i remember that when i was first year in university for me I was just uprooted from something else. So for me, first year university was sex, drug, and a lot of rock and roll. <laughs> so wrong kind of people. Imagine you're an execution trader, 10 years in the business, and you've been like, okay, still sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But it's different automaticity that we're talking about. So the idea behind this is we repeat the we ruminate naturally. Now, there's another dude by the name of Peter Goldwitzer, a fantastic name, who came with an idea, if then plan. It's called implementation intention. So you know you need to all these automaticity. There's this habitual. We have a we have a cue. We execute a habit, and then we have a reward. So what he said is, when this happens, when they show up, because they show up, the rumination shows up, the procrastination shows up. When it happens, make a prepare, make a plan. 
if this happens, then I do this. And he applied this to a physical exercise. Like nobody wants to go to the gym, but everybody wants to have muscles. So the idea there is if I feel like this, then I do that. Now, the final one is Mel Collins. Mel Collins came up with this idea of five, four, three, two, one. You know, like the rocket launch kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this really works. When this happens, oh, five, four, because I procrastinate, I ruminate. I'm just as bad as any other dude. But if I, if I can outrun anyone by just 1% eventually, or outrun myself by 1%, I will eventually improve. So what I've done is actually using the five, four, three, two, one. And if this happens, then I think about something else, or then I take a different action, or then I do pull-ups and so on and so forth. Does it make any sense? No, it does. It does. Yeah. That keeps you from overreacting. It keeps you focused. Cause yeah, I think a lot of it has energy too. Like we'd said earlier, you know, we're so easy and so comfortable. I mean, us men, we have, uh, we have a purpose in nature and some of it's competitive and combative and it's full of energy to design, build, tear down. I mean, it runs the gamut. And if we're not, you know, utilizing that and uh it's just sitting there cooking and ready to blow off like a pressure cooker yeah. at least that's my experience you know uh, <clears throat> um, i agree here is a link that i just put up which is a study and i won't put it on the screen but just you guys look this one up if you're really interested here this one is a study uh by pubmed and the national health uh um and Human Resources Institute about emotional regulation. And in essence, what this says is they study people that could emotionally regulate based on a criteria that's laid out for emotional regulation by the um, American Psychological Association. And those people that could regulate their emotions had less cortisol levels in their body. They tended to be in the higher socioeconomic levels. They slept better. They lived a little bit longer than those that could not regulate their emotions, which makes sense. On the low end of emotional regulation, you're going to have those high alphas that have that really high emotionality that end up in prison, things like that as well. So it does make a little bit of sense, but it's a, it's a dry read, but it's an interesting read. It makes an excellent case for what we talked about last week, and that's not being so vulnerable that you're, you're getting that reaction button pushed all the time. Oh. There's a couple of pieces of advice I would give young guys, and this is really based off of personal experience. One of the things that really helped to develop my ability to emotionally regulate was endurance sports. And there's a couple of things that will come out of this. The first of which is that to train for endurance sports, if you're doing marathons, in my case, it was Ironman triathlon, you're going to transcend uh, motivation. The reality is, is the volume of training that this requires to be successful at these pursuits is going to require you to do it when you don't want to do it. So that's going to help you to develop a distinction around the difference between motivation and discipline. OK, and that's one of the most basic things that you're going to have to have. And then when you get out there and there's a bike ride that's 130 miles, it's going to take six to eight hours, depending on where you're riding. What you're going to find is that there's going to be all kinds of things that happen in the middle of that ride. And you're going to have to lump it and get on with it, whether it's being stung by a bee, you know, I've, I've, that's happened to me. And when you're really, really tired and the sun's beating down on you, you know, something like a flat tire, even a bee sting will set you off. And you have to learn how to manage your emotions to be able to get through that, that event. And at the end of the day, it's just you out there, you know, in, in order to go somewhere where it's 130 miles, you're going to ride way out into the country, away from everybody else. And so you're going to have to manage that. The other thing I would say, you know, and I'm not recommending this to anybody, but my experience with psychedelics when I was younger helped me to develop a mentality where I was able to separate what's happening in that moment from the bigger picture. In other words, this is going to wear off eventually. And, and regardless of what's happening right now, it's incumbent upon me to be able to control my behavior in order to, to see my way out of this. Again, I'm not recommending that to anybody. I'm just telling you that's what shaped my experience over you know the, my young adulthood those two things actually go hand in hand too so when i got into endurance sports i started asking people discreetly once i knew them a little bit whether or not they had any experience in psychedelics and what i found is a lot of people that were endurance sports also had experience in psychedelics when they were younger and i found that to be a very weird parallel no it's not uncommon 
to hear what we're talking about with emotional. Uh, a lot of folks that have traveled, shall we say, and, and do end up having very good emotional control. In fact, maybe I can pull it up. I'm not really sure, but uh, they had terminally ill patients that use. There's this is a real study that used psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. And with uh, the high doses of those, they were able to accept and cope with the death with much less stress. And they actually ended up, you know, surviving longer under the, the terminal cancer thing and at peace with it than they did before the use of those uh, psychedelics. Because those do certain things with that does affect brain chemistry and thought. It, it's an interesting thing. It's it's we don't know a lot about it and why that happens. So it's interesting that you brought that up because I, I kind of kind of had experiences as well. Uh, the ego death. Yes, the guys out there, if they want to dig into this, you know, you can go down that rabbit hole and kind of see what what people say about that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, I'm very appreciative of that. <laughs> Anybody else want to add to that that line of thinking? Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, I, I will. I'll go along with what uh, HUD said there. Uh, I too have did psychedelics and uh, in endurance sport triathlons, and of course I boxed. And the one, and you have to learn how to control your emotions there because, well, for example, like he said, I was I was doing a swim once, and, I, and coming up out of the water, I cut my foot. I had to get three stitches later, but you just have to ignore that. The feeling of pain and oh, is this going to be a problem? Am I going to finish the race? That's at the beginning of the race too. I mean, it kind yeah. of sets the tone a little bit. Where you're like, man, if this is how this is going to go, you, right. you got to just cut those those yeah. those thoughts off of the past. And you're like, all right, exactly. You know, here we go. Exactly. So it didn't affect me at all. But then later, two days later, you know, I can't really walk later. But during the race, I was able to suppress that. And then back to the boxing, the biggest thing for me was fear, not fear of getting beat up, but fear of I guess looking ridiculous or somebody beating me up and I really had to do a meditation and visualization. And I was able to overcome that to where in my pro fights, I was actually half asleep when I got in there. I mean, I was so <laughs> relaxed, but it took a lot of meditation, a lot of visualization, seeing myself how I wanted to be when I was in there, which worked well. And I still, I've practiced meditation for, for over 30 years, different forms, but you're, you're able to, regulate your i mean i can get down to one breath a minute my heart rate drops down to below 40 you can actually control a lot of things in your body with the breath like you were talking with the breath but it takes practice and now people are so quick to run for a pill we we have a net we have a new name every day for a new uh uh disorder and then guess what who's got a pill for it <laughs> so they want to take the easier softer way i mean who wants to go out and do endurance sports i mean unless you're obsessed like i was and like you were maybe, <laughs> but these things build character, inner strength. And with this character and inner strength, you can handle those emotions. You're not carried away with them because you've dealt with them on a personal level in grueling situations, dangerous situations. And then you can deal with, and you get some Karen coming up, get in your face. You can just walk away from her. Mm. And I'll make one more point about the, uh, the airplane where the ladies were hollering back in my day. And in my area, Women wouldn't do that because if they did, there'd be a man there to drag their ass away. But now, now men's hands are tied. They just, there would be a man there. It'd be, it'd be their boyfriend, husband, or somebody to shut them up. But women have been given so much power here in the States legally that, you know, everybody's afraid to touch them, which I understand that for good reason. Would you say that women have more privilege than men in the Western world? Privilege in what respect? What do you mean by privilege? Uh, Privilege means the in abilities to act and behave in certain ways ah. and to reap benefits that men cannot. Exactly. They, they're not held as accountable, which if I'm sure you know this, Thor, but if you look at the stats on punishment and crimes and the length of, of sentences, they never get, you know, they're always sentenced less than the man. Sometimes they're not sentenced at all. And I really go, I believe it goes back to, Everybody really understands the men and women throughout history that women just don't have the logical capabilities to under, to think correctly. So that's why they've never been held as accountable as men. Why is that? Because everybody realizes that they don't, their brains don't work the same way as men. I'm not cutting them down. We're just different. That's all there is to it. Would it be fair to rephrase that and say that because some women can think 
and they can think very well, but it's, uh, but do they react emotionally more often than men? And that gives that, that changes the situation in the modern society because we don't really have the tiger jumping out ready to kill us, but you know, we have men and women and children all around us and decisions being made. And, and that reaction is not necessarily beneficial to anyone. Well, they can't control or regulate their emotions like we're talking here. And, and like uh, I think HUD might have said, that uh, uh, men are becoming more feminine, and thus you have men crying on. I mean, that's a, my, my daughter said last night on the show. I don't know how many guys. She's 15. She goes out with different guys, you know, and it lasts about a month or two because uh, the guys will be calling her up and crying. She said that's happened like 10 times in the last year. These young 15, 16 year old guys will call her up and start crying because maybe she's getting bored with them or whatever. So it's just they're growing up like that, mm -hmm. feminized. Yeah, and you know what's the most common thing that I see in public is men and women yelling and arguing with each other. Sometimes raising voices quite loudly and a lot of huffing, finger yeah. waving and things like that, and yeah. pointing and bobbing. You know, it looked like a bunch of lizards on a log in the heat, you know, getting and what did we <laughs> what did we say back then? Don't make a scene. That's what I would tell a girl if she started that crit. Don't make a scene. You want to talk about this? Let's go to the house. And back in the day, they would listen to the man. Yeah. Now it's like, like you said, they're so privileged and empowered. They have no fear. There's no, there's no control there. And they can't, con I know it sounds misogynistic, but a lot of women, when they get emotional, cannot control themselves. And if they're not with a, a man who is a dominant, not domineering, but a man who is control of himself and leading the relationship, they'll go off like that. Did you see a man with any of those women on there? I didn't see any on the no. airline. Air no, see, there you go. But yeah, you're right. A, a command presence for a man. To be around it, it's comforting in many many ways uh it, now if you're the guy out there and you're a young guy part of the issue i see is you know women in media are very adept watch watch, watch some of the news ladies interviewing a men they're very adept at discovering where the reaction button is on men yeah. to emotion this is really important for you guys to observe out there because we're all susceptible to it this is just one of those things where Boy, if they say just the wrong thing. Remember when it was, boy, say, was, uh, yeah, your mama. Oh, shit, those were fighting words back in the day, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, that that's that emotional button right there getting pushed, right? We all knew that, you and I, Mark, and Jim and Laura, that, that was the word, you know, you had the hot button word. It's kind of stupid, really, when you think about it. But that's what you have to bolster yourself against. Our, our society has, has moved to the point now where in this great, you know, equalism between men and women, women have now been led to believe that they can get in the face of other women and men. Yeah. And, and here's the difference, you know, in, in the old world order, that's not that far in the, in the distant past. <laughs> if that were to happen between men, it would eventually come to blows, whether it was quickly or whether it took, took a minute, uh, it was going to end up in the parking lot or it was going to end up right there in the bar or wherever the case may be, you know, now, this is not the case, you know, and so it's Jordan Peterson talks about this. He's like, we're not really sure what the rules are in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We're just, and it's not, you know, so we're left with this kind of, if it was all men and it was in the military, well, you we just beat the hell out of each other until, you know, until the winner emerges and that's that, you know, mm -hmm. and prisons really work like this because it's all men, you know, I've become aware of this concept of, of the car and somebody has the keys to the car and the car is usually around ethnicity or race and the keys are, are given to the key holder based on their physical prowess. And mm -hmm. so there is a very clear hierarchy of merit based around the physical prowess. And so it's, the system is very well defined. It's very easy to understand. And, in the workplace, we have this situation where the rules are not totally, they're not totally clear, even though we've been doing this 60 years, 70 years, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, we haven't quite sorted this out yet. Laurent. Yeah. Yeah. You guys want to see a quick video that describes exactly that emotional thing when a man snaps. Absolutely. Sure. I got something I want to point out afterwards though. Okay. I'm going to pop this out. So it's safe. And I'll show you guys, and I'll show the audience exactly what I'm talking about. Let's do a share here. Share. Share screen. Window. Where is the Facebooker? Okay, here we go. 
Getting there, getting there, getting there. Where am I? Where am I? Window. Oh, optimize for. Uh, bear with me. Bear with me. Chrome tab. I guess Chrome's just a little bit different. Facebook. All right. You guys see this? Let's see if we can click, click on this video. You guys hear it? Yeah. I can hear it. Look what she's oh, doing. Oh, oh, oh. And he's just standing there. Bleed. He tips over. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. Oh, no. Uh oh. <laughs> That's reality. Uh oh. Uh, that encapsulates it right there. I mean, the, any questions? We'll do it <laughs> one more time, questions. guys. I mean, here we go. So there's this big argument. And she She's watched too many of the modern movies and the modern Marvel stuff and thinks that, you know, Captain Marvel could win the day here. And she's <laughs> emotional. Now, he's got some boiling points there, but he has a giant button. He's got that easy button. She's gonna strike it, and then it's it's freaking game on, and it's not equal. Not even in the slightest is it equal. And here you go. You want to act like a man? You're gonna get treated like a man. Push that easy button. Push that reaction button. How about that? Nope. Now she wants to get away. You know where does it stop? Unless he stops it, he could walk away, but she'll be hitting him in the back. I'll guarantee you. Well, not now. <laughs> no, not, not now she won't. No, I mean, this, is, this is the court of emotional regulation, so it doesn't matter what she's done. That is a serious assault right there. And, and the reality is, it depends on the size you are as a man, a male, you could do serious, serious permanent damage wow. to that female that is going to follow did. you through life in a way that you'll never be able to get away from. And so, no. I mean, that is... You know, the I idea is to not let it get to that point. Did you see her head <laughs> slam the ground? Yes, that's what I'm I mean, talking it went about. Down this is a skull fracture. You know? I, I, I've said it's it on the, on the show. Right yeah, I've said it on the show a couple of episodes ago. I said, look, when, when a girl punches me, you know, I'll, I'll laugh a little bit and it might leave a bruise or something. When I start punching her, bones start getting broken in faces. I mean, it is, it, it's not the same. No, that second punch, this happened right there. And then the head, and then she saw the white, and then the head bounced off the concrete. That's very serious. No one should ever do that. That is the consequence of revealing your easy emotion reaction button. You're, you're ringing yeah. a bell that you can't Walk unring. away, run, whatever you got to do at yeah. the distance. Should have stopped long before then. He, he could see all the markers coming, but she reacts and continues to react. He had all that space in the parking lot to leave. Yeah, she might chase him a little bit. But in reality, you know, he had that emotional reaction button boiling because at his size, she and you saw her easily controllable, easily controllable, even with a wrist lock or just a small choke. No, but yeah. no. Press Guys, you don't want to be button. dealing with females like this. No, any, that's the rest of your life. that wants to pretend like she's got... The same physical prowess as a man. This is not somebody you want to deal with. You don't want to be around them. I feel for you deeply if you've procreated with them. That's a bell you can't unring. I mean, this is, you know, these things have consequences and some of them last 18 to 20 years or a lifetime. That was yeah. maybe a lifetime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. There you go. So wrong. First of all, right. the so skull wrong. fracture. It's not, it's not, it's not supported in any way because that's ridiculous. Number one, no matter what's going on there. Uh, and, and number two, that man should have the emotional regulation. He could have shut her down years ago. But here's the thing. Um, well, soon after he met her. But here's the thing, guys. If you have emotional regulation, you won't get that far. You'll be very well protected yeah. against that. And that's what we're yeah. talking about today. How do you do yeah. that? Rationalism, empiricism, mindfulness, and the ability to recognize when somebody's actually looking to push buttons. And here's a big problem. With all the consultations I did, there is a need in relationships with females right now, at least those that I've counseled at all ages, to, if they don't feel anything in their board, they want to feel something. Mm -hmm. If it's not those good feelings, right. 
they'll generate drama just to feel something and be excited. Right. This is the consequence of this machine right here and all the media that comes in. You have to be aware that I need to feel something. Good, bad, wrong, violent, something. Mm -hmm. And that's why you even see these gals that get attracted. Heck, I just saw, I don't have the video, but there was just a sheriff's deputy that let out a hardened criminal and ran off with him. You know, here in California, female prison guards are not allowed to be around the males on the company at all. There's a reason for that. Yeah. They all end up all in love with the prisoners and they help them escape and shit and they do stuff for them. So that is just not allowed. Um, crazy, isn't it? But that's high burst of And then, of course, some of those gals really are attracted to the violence of it mm. and they need that violence and then the makeup sex afterwards is so crazy high you see and that's living on emotionalism not healthy yeah. at all thor we've got one of those going in alabama right now i think they're oh, on the run they found really? a vehicle in tennessee and i mean that's this is it. a textbook i that's mean it. i think you've seen it in the news it's unfolding right now they haven't found them either right now right now yeah yeah, yeah. And, and in addition to that if that's not a pro for, uh, enough for you guys to emotionally regulate look at johnny depp and amber heard he didn't emotionally yeah. regulate yeah, and that started Elon a long Musk, time. One of the yeah. smartest men in the world was not able to emotionally regulate when he got connected with her. That's how dangerous she is. Guys, it's going to take more than fame and fortune. Okay. And smarts. You're gonna it's going to take more than fame and fortune. fortune. The difficulty is when you, as a uh, as Texas uh, Chad said, as Jimmy said, the difficulty is when you've procreated with them because, like, you know, with all these crazies, we know the sex is awesome. <laughs> and they love bomb in the beginning. I mean, they, they, they clock a, nice, a gentle 11 on a 0 to 10 scale in the, in the sheets. So a lot of guys end up procreating with those narcissistic chicks. And uh, how do you regulate after the facts? And that's difficult. How, you, how do you bring it back to livable, to tolerable? That is very, very difficult. So, so you have a lot of experience on this. I would really like to hear your, your thoughts on this. And Mark as well. It's easier to start over than it is to. I was telling Thor before the show that I had a, a girl that was diagnosed at uh, ex wife of mine. The last one that was diagnosed would be a borderline personality disorder. We went to counseling together, and and you just can't. I think you that's something you, know, you didn't cause it, so you really can't cure it. You can't fix it. I don't know how you there's really nothing you can do about it uh, because they they can change from one type of person. They can be the nicest person you've ever met, but then an hour or two later, they can be like the most evil person you've ever met. It's almost like they can't control it. I don't know. Mine was given medicine, but then she wouldn't take the medicine. So yeah, well, I just think it's something that you just really need to stay away from those people. And if you're involved with somebody like that, I guess there's different levels of it. So yeah. mine was pretty extreme. And she tried to get me to react like that guy down there several times. And, of course, I didn't. But they will push your buttons and push your buttons. Uh, she got to where she would actually call guys in front of me and talk to them about meeting them, just trying to get me to do something. And of course, I didn't do it. But they just, yeah. Like, like Amber and uh, who was Johnny Depp, mm -hmm. that started a long time ago before it got to that point. Mm. And that he allowed that, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of red flags. He allowed it just like I did when I got to that point with my last ex-wife. I let it get to that point. I could have stopped it. I could have left earlier, but it's a, it's like a sickness and our cancer gets worse and worse and worse. And if the man is not leading properly, which I wasn't at the time, then you get to the point of Johnny Depp and then Amber Heard. Yeah, that's definitely a good escape if you're leading properly. I will tell you guys this beauty is a, a, a huge <laughs> camouflage. This so take a look at yeah. Amber when she's dolled up. Oh, All right, yeah. take a look at some of the crazies that are out there. Um, they are very much nines and tens a lot of times. Oh, yeah. And um, society gives them a pass. People believe them because they're very pretty. They're innocent looking. They have a childlike quality a lot of times in their looks and their demeanor. And that is not the case. They're definitely demons in a lot of ways. And, and they have their own personal demons too. Right. I'll tell you a story about a guy that, at, at my work years ago. He was married to a beautiful, beautiful girl, but she was like this and caused a lot of fights. Over the course of five years, he nearly lost a job. Uh, drugs were found on his car one time. 
but they had security footage of her planting them. Hmm. And then there was a noms call to the cops. That turned into a big deal. And then she threatened to kill him. The cops suggested surveillance. And she actually hired somebody to kill him, and the gun did not go off. They actually, hmm. yeah, they'd actually, guy actually walked up to the car and tried to kill him. And it was a guy that she had started an affair with. And she's spending, you know, a good 30 years in jail now. Well, in California, she probably spent three years, but yeah. <laughs> um, she's very beautiful. Beautiful women will get a beautiful people, really. I mean, there's even men that get a pass, and that's right. just that's reality. Yeah, now, if, privilege. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: they grow up with that privilege. Does that right. privilege actually breed this borderline personality disorder? Maybe. Possible. What about high burst of fear, the need to be have the or not uh, not that uh, histrionic disorder. They have that need for attention. Well, if they're getting attention all the time, if they're really beautiful people. Right. You know, and that's an amazing thing too. I don't know. I mean, that's those are good questions to ask. There is some things out there if you're a guy. If you're a guy that is highly emotion, there's something out there that's a, a derivative of cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'm not too much on therapy, but this is good therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is good therapy. Um, and it works well. And it's called dialectic behavior therapy. Look it up if you're like that. And this particular type of therapy is also used and shows an effectiveness with BPD disorder, mm -hmm. if you can catch it early. It's called uh, DBT. Look it up on Very Well Mind or any of those. Dialectic behavior therapy. It's been out there for a long time. Um, I would recommend that. But anyway, back to the panel. What do you think, guys? HUD, you had something? Yeah, I just was going to say, like, definitely with that, um, when we're talking about this and uh, the girl who ended up getting me arrested, she uh, was diagnosed with borderline as well. And I know we throw that out all the time um, in this space, but I'm speaking the truth. And with all these types of things, when you get your first red flag, pay attention. When you get your second, pay a little bit more attention. Once you hit your third, you got to get out. Because when these things start going, the cycle of happiness and then a fight gets shorter and shorter and shorter until it blows. It gets to its breaking point. And that breaking point is what happened for me. And we don't want anybody to get to that breaking point. Like in that video with that guy, that was the final breaking point. But it should have never came to that. You know, not everybody has their best day. So... First couple times something happens, all right, accept it, understand it, think about it, but don't let it get to that point. It's just not worth it. No. That, that that explosion that you saw from that guy, that was built up over a long time. I yeah. agree. And so the first mistake that you made was was that period of time where all that was building up. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the other thing I would say too, and Huds, I am not indicting you on this, but I would I would reframe the language a little bit. You got yourself arrested. And and I and I want other guys to hear that because it, it involves taking responsibility for ourselves. No one's going to do it for us. No one's looking out for us. OK, got myself arrested and so on and so forth. And so I will tell you this. You know, this was a number of years ago. I had a I was dating a girl at the time, one of several girls that I was dating. And we had been out that evening. And she re I said something that she didn't think was cute. And she reached over and, and, and basically boxed me on one of my ears with like a closed palm. Okay. Mm. And I was so shocked by that. She was a lot smaller than me. I kind of looked over at her and I, I was, my reaction was, did you really just do that? And uh, we had both had a little bit to drink and I took a very deep breath. And I, I felt absolutely no anger whatsoever. I was more shocked that she had done it because it now it's created this situation where you got to address it. You can't really ignore that, you know. And I told her, I said, "You need to be careful with that. That's going to get you in trouble." You know, me, not so much. Other guys, you, know, you get end up in a situation that you can't get out of. I paid the tab. That was the end of that. Yeah, you know, I like and, that. and I hope she heeded that advice because there's there's other guys where that's not going to fly. Um, and that's that. I mean, and that's the way to handle that. Right. Um, if it had been a, if it had been any of the men on this panel that she would have 
she would have perforated my eardrum and we'd be in a different situation, but <laughs> it wasn't, you know, um, this will happen. This will happen <laughs> in a heartbeat, you know, and that's the, in the, in, you know, and there were probably other red flags that I ignored. So Hud's made a really good point. You know, you're, you're, you're generally the red flags are ignored because mm-hmm. you've got one thing in mind, you know, you're yeah. driving towards it, you know, yeah. you're doing the cost benefit analysis <laughs> uh, and you're not, you don't have the full balance sheet in front of you to really understand what's at risk there, you know? And so that's this, this, it's a series of red flags that get ignored generally. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. So guys, there's a lot of guys out there watching. They'll watch this and they will, they will feel that this really connected with them because they get those feelings. They Sometimes they wake up, they want to cry. Sometimes they get really angry. They want to throw this paper down and just, oh, boy, I would just knock them out, right? A lot of that's pent up because life is a little easy. We don't have those outlets. So, you know, and then you couple that with a relationship where there's a little bit of drama in between and button pushing to get those highs and lows. What would you say would be your best advice for a young man starting out? Why he shouldn't adopt emotionalism and why he should look towards the stoic arts and different philosophies to regulate his emotions. What would your one recommendation be? Let's start with Mark and we'll work our way back. Well, recommendation of how they can handle it or why they Mm -hmm. should try to learn how to handle it, how they can handle it. I would say get into a contact sport of some kind or okay. an endurance sport because that gives you a an an out, know, how I say outlet. It, outlet yeah an outlet mm-hmm. to 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 let this anger emotion out because I don't really believe that nothing makes me angry but I create situations or step into situations to express the anger that's already in me and when I find myself getting angry which I don't as much nowadays as I used to I have to ask myself, where is this coming from? Because it's not has nothing to do with the tool that's broke or the day isn't going right, the guys aren't working hard, whatever it happens to be. It's something within me. But I do find that probably sports, boxing, triathlons probably kept me out of jail because it, it helped me to control my emotions because when I was so focused on that and putting so much energy into that, these other things did not bother me much. So let's say... And I was in situations like that guy on the video. I had a woman, I was on my Harley once, and she hadn't been there for a couple of days, and she hit me 10 or 15 times. I just laughed at her. And I used to get in relationships back in my 20s like that. <laughs> and uh, I did go in the house with her, and I had to wrestle her down to the floor, but I never hit her, of course, but I wanted to. You wrestled her for a different reason, right? Yeah. But the point is, I was able to control it because I had my energies being expended somewhere else. So I could, at that time I was boxing, I was training hard and I just laughed at it. But if you're not like my kids, a lot of times I'll see them playing the games too much and you should see the emotion that comes up from them. If they've sat there and played them for hours and hours. It's like a rage almost. And I think it maybe where some of this emotionalism is coming from too. People spending so much time on social media xbox etc etc because they have the same energies and feelings as if they were in a war but they're not physically moving so that physical you have a need a physical need to you got to get that out somehow so thus we have these either crying or anger emotional outbursts just a an idea of where some of them may be coming from i like that that's a good idea so you know having yourself a physical outlet like that's very good Hud, you're you're um you know you're pretty mature for your age, and you've been out there, made mistakes socially, just like we all have, and you're coming through, you know this rite of passage right now. What would be your advice to someone coming in behind you about this emotionalism, in order to better themselves and be prepared for the future? Absolutely. So the number one thing that I have to say is that when somebody comes to you upset, somebody gets angry, somebody is having an outburst. Take a moment, be present in what's going on and try and understand where they're coming from so that you can handle it. Sometimes, especially like I noticed this with every single girl I've ever dated, they're getting upset, not necessarily at something like I did or or what, or they're not having the um, exact emotional reaction they should to what's going on. 
but it's because there's something deeper inside yeah. that they have not shared. So if you're able to take a step back and think through, okay, why are they reacting this way? Then you can move forward and address it. And a lot of times you can disarm a situation so freaking quickly. It's crazy. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Lauren, if you had some advice, you're mentoring a young man willing to pick up these stocks and sell shorts and all that sort of stuff. And he's just riding too high on the emotions, you know, maybe he's got a little bit of a gambler's itch in there. What would you, um, what advice would you give him? So back in 2008, I had a front row seat for the market meltdown, like literally the front row seat. I mean, the, the borrow overnight when, like when they in, initiated the ban on fi shorting financials in the U.S., the borrow overnight went to uh, from general collateral into how to, to borrow, which means like the world came shorting on our doorstep. And I walked over to my boss, said, this is going to be a long a drink. And then I listened to the Toccata of Bach and I listened to the fifth of Beethoven and everybody were losing their shit. <laughs> the entire floor, like 100 people were losing their shit. They're like, dude, what's happening with you? You come. Well, you know, the difference between uh, a pro and an amateur, a pro, an amateur will piss his pants. A pro will get the job done with wet pants on. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Laurent, that's why you're here, brother. I love you, man. <laughs> Laurent, the, the market makes the noise when it's in that state on the floor. There's a certain noise that you can hear, you know, it's different than everything else, I think. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Jimmy, you know, I know I, oh, go ahead. Laurent, finish up. Yeah, please. Oh, and there's uh, one technique that I've adopted recently when people want to push your buttons. And this is, I call it, and I do this in a, at the moment, I'm also helping someone in Southeast Asia. It is in a Muslim country. And the wife is like crazy on a different scale. Uh, <laughs> but he has no custody of the kids. He has no, it's, it's terrible. And uh, there's nothing he can do. And uh, I practice this with everybody in my life now, whether it's professional, whether it's relationship, I practice asympathetic compassion. So as I had said, like when somebody comes over to you, we all are, uh, we all, uh, are uh, dynamite sticks walking around looking for matches. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> any single thing will trigger us. So the idea there is asympathetic compassion is like when people show up with their emotions and whatnot, I see the struggle and... I have compassion for the struggle, but I have zero beginning of sympathy. You created that story. You created this luggage. I am not here to, I'm not a porter. And I think this discipline of, uh, I think this presence of mind of being present without being hooked is fantastic. And it actually empowers people on the other hand, like, okay, this is your responsibility. This is your story. You carry it. And people think, oh, shit, I need to do that. And I do that with my kids. I do that with the people I work with. I do that with my wife, with everybody in my life. And it works. And it works for me as well, because then it, it, it's a natural shield around me. Does it make any sense? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I love it. I got to get out of here, guys. It's been a pleasure. Hey, you want to plug something? We're going to wrap it up uh, after uh, uh, okay. uh, Jimmy goes. All right, well, you can check me out at uh, Mark's Inspiration on Instagram. On my YouTube channel is Mark Daniels, Mark's Inspiration. And check out the uh, Amazon books. I have two books out coming back home, The True Adventure of Mark Daniels and The Power is Within by Mark Daniels. So I got to go. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Thor. Always. Anytime. See, You're always good here. Thank see you. you, guys. See you, buddy. So, uh, Jimmy, you. you had one thing you wanted to convey maybe to uh, a young guy coming up here that has a lot of emotionality. You know, that we like to end on positive notes. What would you have today? This is what I would say. You need to find something that is so compelling that you want to do so badly that you're willing to sleep on the shop floor because you can't afford an apartment and you're willing to eat the ramen and you're so obsessed by it that days will go by and you haven't showered. And what you're going to find is that's going to filter out everything else that doesn't get you to that. And if you haven't found it yet, you need to keep looking. And when you're young, when you're really young, and Hudsel backed me up on this, not that he's really young, 
is that you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have anything to lose and you don't need anything. Okay. And so in the, in that is a lot of space to really create something powerful, something that'll make you a lot of money and something that's going to filter out the rest of the distractions in the world where you don't even see them. You don't even see them, you know? So, so very briefly here, I know we're trying to wrap up. It was funny. Amber Heard complained about, about, uh, about uh well no it was it was it is elon musk's what either ex-wife or baby mama or whatever that relationship is and she was saying the, the guy the guy sleeps on a mattress that's got a hole in it and he's living in a he's living in a it's either a rent house or it's a house that he bought that's like 50 or sixty thousand dollars or something Daniel, yeah and 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 she she basically tldr was complaining that he doesn't live a billionaire lifestyle and he'll tell you i don't have a yacht i don't I don't have this. I don't have that. And I kind of always assumed he did. And we just didn't know what the name was. You know, he's kind of a guy that has it wrapped in a bunch of a bunch of different corporate structures. And it's like, yeah. uh, you're kind of like an oligarch. It's like it's out there. You just don't know about it. Well, he doesn't. OK. And what that tells me is between going to Mars and building rockets that go to Mars and building electric cars that you put in the rockets that are going to Mars, you don't have any time for that. OK. And she don't like it. The whole thing made me laugh. So, I mean, fine. Elon's on a mission. Find something that moves you like that. And it's just going to filter out everything else. I promise you. Yeah, that's awesome. He does exhibit a lot of minimalist lifestyle choices, which is really good. So, guys, go check out Aaron Clary. Definitely offering that minimalist lifestyle uh, course, which is comprehensive. It's like 20 hours worth of stuff. Really a good way to start out. And, you know, when you start doing minimalism, it gives you that task level to have an outlet that you're accomplishing something for the future. I would recommend that as a possible solution. Now, now for my input, if you're doing the same things over and over again, and you're telling yourself, man, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I'm not getting anywhere. Well, that's a good indicator that you're doing the wrong things. So start with the Stoics. I'm going to, I'm going to give one example. It's my favorite one. It's from Marcus Aurelius. He wrote Meditations, and it's from 11.18.5b. That is an example of anger, control, and temper. And when I do my emotional durability courses, I focus on three emotions. Anger, fear, and sadness. That's all I want you to practice regularly. Because when you do that, the rest of the secondaries get much, much easier. Those are the ones that get us in serious fucking trouble. So keep this thought. This is Marcus Aurelius' quote. Keep this thought handy when you feel a fit of rage coming on. It is not to be a man to be enraged. Rather, gentleness and civility are much more human and therefore much more manlier. A real man does not give away to anger and discontent. And such a person has much strength, courage, and endurance to make the right decisions. Unlike the angry and complaining, the nearer a man comes to a calm mind, the closer he is to true strength. That man was an emperor. In fact, the favorite emperor of the Roman Empire. Kind of a ground up sort of guy. Worked from the bottom up. One of the few came from the bottom working class up. Of course, he had some relatives that were royals, but really came from nowhere to somewhere. Now, his son wasn't very good, but he was fantastic. Lived to a ripe old age. So I'll leave you with that on the stoic side and we'll go ahead and wrap up. We'll start with Lauren again. What do you got out there? Where can anybody find you? Lauren, what do you got in the fire? Can anybody find you? Do you want to advertise anything? Oh yeah. I mean, the market is crapping out. Re uh, two things are rest in peace and the market, the bull market and our beloved uh, Kevin Samuels. So I have a book about short selling. I have a course about short selling with Python uh, the question is, not, I mean, if, you, if you're if you in the market, the question is not whether you should buy this book. Is it, really, the question now is, can you afford not to read this book? <laughs> yes. so, <laughs> so that's it. Tomorrow I'll be on, a, on a, a Jonathan's Amendment Network. Shout out to MLD. We'll be yep. talking, having a conversation about money. So that's it. That's pretty I'll much it. That would be great, man. I I can't need to help. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. What you got going, man? Good to have you on board. Thanks for jumping in today. It was great to have your perspective. We'll have you back again. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thor. I really appreciate it. So um, if you if you want to find me, it's at the Huds Man, the plus Huds, 
plus man um, on Instagram. That's the easiest way to contact me. Um, we can get back to you with, with whatever. Um, I do a lot of dating coaching, like dating mindset. I work with people of all ages, so it really doesn't matter. Um, but it's what I love doing, and I'm very good at it, um, if I do say so myself. Um, and I also have to say, uh, if you are part of Thor's Dragon Ship, or if you're not yet, definitely check that out. I have a special presentation coming on Tuesday that is going to be very, very exciting and very thought-provoking. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Texas Chad, Jimmy, man. Thank you for coming tonight. Your input. I always learn something for you, brother. Thank you for coming. Well, I appreciate the chance to be with you and all these guys. I don't have anything to sell you. Uh, the Jimmy Miller on Instagram, the Jimmy Miller on Twitter and uh, Facebook. As long as I'm still on all those platforms. Good to see you guys tonight. Well, I will sell something, It's but it's really at no cost. Uh, I mean, it costs you a little bit of money, but the stuff you learn will pay you back tenfold, and that's come join the Dragon Ship. It's a monthly subscription to a mastermind that's three to four hours long. Uh, we got a few dozen guys in there, and it's an amazing learning experience. It is somewhat of a modern men's club in which the old purpose is to be better men today than we were yesterday. So we're educating each other this week or this month. We'll be having Huds come on and give me a presentation with his uh, with his um, students. And that should be pretty exciting. And both Laurent and uh, Jimmy both gave amazing presentations on money and taking a company through an IPO. Holy crap. You don't get this anywhere, guys. So come and check it out on becomedurable.com. Sign up for the Dragon Ship and come see us once a month. Appreciate it, guys. And with that, I am going to go ahead and close it out. Thanks, guys.